Now, it's time for a little fun. For the first time ever, we're going to present a sneak peek of the forthcoming memoirs of the founder, uh, founder of the Interfaith Center, Reverend James Parks Morton. Dean Morton was urged by many friends to tell his powerful story, and after several years of toil with pad and pencil, he has produced what you're about to sample. His life's journey unfolds over eight days, with each day punctuated by a transformative encounter or experience. Asked why eight days, Dean Morton explained that the number eight has great significance in many religious traditions, particularly in Buddhism, Judaism, and Christianity. So ladies and gentlemen, for your enjoyment, this unique gift. in Manhattan that had been of interest to him since the late 1920s. The great limestone and granite Gothic Cathedral of St. John the Divine in Morningside Heights, said to be, even in its unfinished state, the largest cathedral in the world, two football fields in length and tall enough to accommodate the Statue of Liberty under its dome. The entire 13-acre cathedral complex was both impressive in size and also very beautiful with its landscaped gardens. Its stained glass windows are magnificent. Over the entrance, the giant Louis window is 30 feet in diameter with the seated life-size figure of Christ in the exact center. 
It was all unlike anything I had ever seen. Also at the cathedral were giveaway posters, combining the sculpture logo of the New York, New York World's Fair together with a photograph of St. John the Divine saying, help us complete New York's great cathedral. To this day, I have a framed copy of that poster. But how was I to know that I would be ordained an Episcopal priest at St. John the Divine when I was 24, and called to be the dean of that very same cathedral when I was 42? The, the second day, day. You'll have to buy the book. <laughs> the third day, Jersey City. <laughs> Paul Moore's talk in my junior year at Harvard took my understanding of friendship to a radically different level. To God himself initiating friendship. With us, through our openness to the other. To the friend, through our own spiritual poverty. For me personally, Paul Moore ended with a question. What work of friendship and spiritual poverty could you do? His words about transformation and friendship and poverty changed my life's work. So I met Pamela Taylor in January. <laughs> and we were married in December 1954. I was then a priest and at work in Jersey City with Paul Moore. The rectory was known as an open rectory and it literally was open to members of the largely African-American parish, the neighborhood, and the street. In the front hall by the door was a small framed quotation from St. Benedict. Let, Let all guests be received as Christ. Christ. In the fall and winter of 1949 and 50, the large parish hall attached to the church became, on alternative afternoons and nights, a basketball court, a craft class. And most important of all, three evenings a week, a live TV show was played. In 1949, TV was new, and none of our families had a TV set. So, when Pamela and I came to Grace Church in 1954, five years after the new ministry had been started, there was already in place both a large Sunday school and also a huge summer day in Bible school directed by the new resident order of the Sisters of St. John the Baptist. Equally important was the two-month summer program with its summer staff of college and seminary students and older Grace teenagers. Our fieldwork seminarians from across the river kept the clergy at Grace Church up to speed theologically. In fact, even in the year of John the 23rd's amazing election, Bob Weiss, our seminarian, asked me if I heard Father Alexander Schneemann lecture. I confess, I'd never even heard of the man. Who was he? Bob simply said, Schmemann is the new dean of New York St. Vladimir Seminary, a Russian Orthodox priest from Paris. Liturgical theology is Schmemann's main focus, like your own, and you just must go hear him lecture, a suggestion for which I and my family are eternally grateful. Living eight years in Jersey City expanded my experience of spiritual poverty through the reality of friendship. And in Canada, living inside the diversity of the natural green creation itself and being open to welcoming human and cultural diversity through friends of different race and color, culture and language, nationality and religion, especially through friends who have also been persecuted and imprisoned, oppressed and deprived, and lived in both physical and spiritual poverty. The fourth day, Chicago. After eight years in Jersey City and two more in New York City, I accepted the call to become the director of the new Urban Training Center in Chicago. Chicago, Chicago, Most of these white clergy types have never felt poverty or ostracism in their gut. So Archie created the, the plunge. At the beginning of each training session on Monday morning, everyone, about 90% male, was given directions. Number one, not to shave on Tuesday morning. Number two, wear old clothes. Number three, bring a toothbrush. Number four, leave in your room your wristwatch, all jewelry, and money. Number five, leave behind all personal papers. Number six, bring your social security card. Number seven, meet all together Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. at the street door. When we all met at the center on Tuesday at 9 a.m., each trainee was given $3 and told that 
For the next three days, everyone was separately going to live on the streets? You could not return to your room at the Y at night. Instead, you could go to all-night movies, waiting rooms at bus and train stations, or gospel shelters. You could, of course, beg at churches, sell your blood, and handle, or try to get a day job. On Friday evening, we all met at the local bar near the Y for drinks and supper in the back room, followed by a shared sermon highlighting our new insights from the three days on the streets and culminated with Holy Communion. Everyone agreed that their great learning experiences were first being avoided on the street. Next, tried to find a public bathroom, exhaustion and so forth. Both unexpected meanness and kindness from strangers. The plunge was soon written up with pictures in time and news we shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. In 1965, we took the whole training center down to Selma, Alabama. Upon returning, I had a serious meeting with Paul Ilbesacker of the Ford Foundation. Paul asked me about the training center's black to white ratio. 50-50, he asked. About one to 15, I replied. These are largely white denominations. That's nuts, Paul said. <coughs> if you can get it up to 50-50, the foundation will pay for an all black clergy. So I went to Atlanta and spoke to both Dr. King and Andy Young, who was on the center, center of the board's directors. Dr. King said, This is important. I'll give you our Director of Affiliates for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Reverend C.T. Vivian, who knows every black minister in the country. But Ford must also pay not only for every black clergyman's four-week program, but also for his weekly round-trip airfare home. He has to be in his home pulpit every Sunday morning. That's the bread and butter reality of black churches. Will you agree to these conditions? I said yes without a moment's hesitation. CT joined our staff and his family moved up to from Atlanta. He created a hugely successful and very classy fellowship, Ford Fellowship Program. And with those four fellows, the Urban Training Center became 50-50, black to white. The fifth day, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. was elected Bishop of New York, and in 1971, Paul first asked me to consider being the Dean of St. John the Divine. The cathedral has not had a dean since 1966, and it really needs to be turned around, and I think you're crazy enough to do it. <laughs> so I took Paul's word seriously, and I spoke in length with Pamela and five old friends. They all said, Go! 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 In 1971, I was formally interviewed by a committee of the bishop and three cathedral trustees. And in April, I was officially called to be the seventh dean of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. And with our four daughters, we moved to New York City. As the new dean, my first major job was to act creatively on the cathedral's three specific areas of ministry. As clearly set forth in the legal language of its formal charter from the state of New York of 1873. To be a house of prayer for the use of all people. To be an instrument of church unity. To be a center of intellectual light and leading. This statement of the cathedral's universal versus parochial mission was an explicit command to present the wisdom of the world's greatest thinkers and doers. Scientists, public servants, artists, intellectuals, activists, reformers, and demonstrably spiritual and holy men and women both at the cathedral's pulpit and its programmatic outreach to the diversity of New York's global community. First, beginning in 1973, we had to rewrite and bring up to date the cathedral's original 19th century legal charter of bylaws about trustees. Only Episcopal laymen and priests, to include trustees of both women and non-Episcopalians. Secondly, we created new bylaws for honorary canons and lay cathedral colleagues to include the most distinguished religious, artistic, 
and scientific leaders, irrespective of their particular beliefs. A third structural change made the Cathedral Choir School co-educational and brought female choristers and acolytes into traditional male preserves. And fifth, highly visible new change. We invited both visual and performing artists and artistic ensembles to become artists in residence. The first nine Cathedral Artists in Residence were an exceedingly popular gift to New York, a city increasingly interracial international, and interfaith. Philippe Petit was the first official artist in residence. I first met him at the then new Big Apple Circus in my second year at the cathedral. <laughs> Everyone was delighted with Philippe's presence, except early on when I got an emergency call from the paper security guard saying that Philippe had been arrested for walking on stilts inside the church. And I must come over at once. There was Philippe in handcuffs. None of these popular and highly successful artists did we pay. Instead, we opened up the vast, unused cathedral basement crypt and offered each an artistic home and office. Free workspaces in which to create, rehearse, and perform. And the greatest gift of all their access to the amazing performance space upstairs in the vast, majestic cathedral. The sixth day, the Green Revolution and the crisis of the environment. Even now, in 2014, everyday American green thinking seems far from urgent, even if in 1973 it was almost unknown. Vice President Al Gore, his January 2013 book, the future, six drivers of global change, and President Obama's urgent environmental priorities could not be more vitally needed. The seventh day, the Interfaith Center of New York, safeguarding diversity. In 1996, when I was planning to retire from the cathedral, my old friend Alan Slivka, president of Big Apple Circus, and my first Jewish trustee at the cathedral, seriously said to me, New York, more than any city in the world, needs an interfaith center. After your 25 years at the cathedral, you could do it. So, with Alan as the chairman of this new interfaith center board, and myself as the president, the new interfaith center came into legal existence on my 67th birthday. My 25 years at the cathedral, with many of the world's most interesting religious leaders of different faiths, United Nations officials, environmentalists, and artists in residence, plus my earlier 16 years of community organizing in Jersey City and Chicago, all together served as useful preparation for the Interfaith Center's first years of operation. In February 1997, the new center held its first public program, The Poor Are Credible, with Mohammed Yunus. The September opening of the United Nations, United Nations General Assembly became the occasion for the new Interfaith Center's annual fall program, celebrating the interfaith reality of the United Nations. A miracle followed in 1998, when a large financial bequest was given the new center in honor of my old personal friend, Rabbi Marshall Meyer, whom I had met in a tent at the foot of Mount Sinai. <laughs> you know it so loud, you son of a bitch! <laughs> The grant in his name was given specifically for a continuing interfaith program for the city's new immigrant religious leadership. The center's decision in June of 2000 to begin the series of all-day conferences on the world's major religions, starting with the Muslims of New York, was indeed providential preparation for what was to happen on September 11, 2001, known today simply as 9-11. The center was the first place to host an interfaith press conference three days after the tragic events. By May of 2002, the new national visibility of the interfaith center led its board to conclude that the time had come for the center to hold an annual first class fundraising event. Therefore, in June 2002, here in the New York Hilton, the initial James Parks Morton Interfaith Awards Dinner went to the very top and honored the
to be continued.